by the time I get home. So the hospitality um, that has been showed to us and the love that's been showed to us, it's an it's amazing thing to live in another country and we're neighbors and just feel like we have family uh, over here. So I'm very, very grateful uh, for each of you. Let's ask the Lord to, to uh, speak to us through his word today. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us this precious word, Lord, you have preserved it for us. You have spoken it um, through, through men. You have inspired it, and you have delivered it over to us to, to know who you are, to know what you're like, to know what you think, and to know your heart, and to, to know the way of salvation, the way that we could be brought to you, the way that we could uh, not just be saved from our sin and its power and its consequences, um, but we could be saved from you, the judgment uh, that is to come. And Lord, we thank you that you reconciled us to yourself. And and it it wasn't just to to do and to, to save us and walk away, but to walk with us in this life. Well, thank you for wanting to have a relationship with us and to walk together with us, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you would bless our time tonight, that you would bless your word, God. We can't understand it on our own. We we can't understand it with our mind. We can't understand it with with social construct or traditions, God. We, We understand it by your spirit. These things are spiritually discerned. And so I just ask you, please, as we read your word, that you, by your spirit, would read it to us and and open the eyes of our understanding, Lord, so that we would go away from this place and we would be edified and built up and encouraged in you, Lord, that we would see your word and we would be changed, we'd be affected, and we'd become more like you, I pray, more like Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So in thinking about kind of what to share with you, I just wanted to be able to encourage you. I felt, and sometimes I feel like people misunderstand, I believe, that the word or title or office or however you want to call it, uh, evangelist. Sometimes people think that an evangelist is, is someone that is outgoing, somebody that's really good, uh, at sharing their faith with others, someone that uh, maybe is articulate or has found different tools or ways, and then they're very passionate about it. And so people would say, well, that person is an evangelist because they do it a lot. I think that's what we're all supposed to do, you know, in various ways and various reasons. It seems to me uh, very clearly from the Word of God and from Jesus that he is telling us all to go out and share and make disciples. Every one of us are to do it. And sometimes when we label uh, and these, oh, well, they're evangelists, they have the gift of evangelism, uh, there's a little bit of like, uh, well, they do that, but I do this. And, and I'm not saying that we, we don't have different ways and different uh, you know, gifts and abilities and how we share our faith, but sometimes we don't share at all. Um, and I think the church has failed in that, and one of the reasons is because we haven't had, actually had real uh, evangelists in the sense of what Ephesians 4 is teaching. So Ephesians 4, it says that God gave the church, right, apostles, prophets, teachers, shepherds, and evangelists. That's what he gave the church. And then it says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. And I really see the role of an evangelist, what God has called me to, is... is to do what everyone's supposed to do, share the gospel, but to equip and build up the church so that they can share the gospel. And I think that because we have failed to recognize as a, as a church, as a whole, um, and I don't, know about, I, don't, I don't know how this church body works, maybe you have it, but because we don't have that individual that we see that gift in, we don't uh, it, in a sense, prepare them or give them room to teach the body, then boldness is it, hard to come by when 
you don't have the tools. It's interesting, like if you were to make an announcement and you said, we're going to have a, a class on evangelism, like, hmm, it's not very well attended, you know? You have a, a church of a few hundred and a couple people will show up. But if you said, we're going to have a class on how to share your faith with anyone, all kinds of people show up. Because, because there's a sense that uh, we know inside us that we're supposed to share our faith with anyone, but we really don't know how. We really don't have the, have the tools. And I believe that evangelist is supposed to do that. And so pray about that. Those that may have the gift within your body, that, uh, that the Lord would raise them up, not just to go out, don't just depend on them to go share. We should all be sharing where we are, but that they would find a place within this body to teach to teach some classes on how to share your faith and, and encourage one another uh, in that. So, so I, I, I see myself as a, both sharing the faith, but also wanting to share with you some things that maybe can help you. And then this one here, I think, is really, really foundational. And I'm, I'm sure you're exhorted and challenged in it, but it's a, definitely been a burden on my heart, particularly as I've been on the streets and I've kind of seen the way that this world is going. Uh, so the title of the message today is called uh, Circumspect. Circumspect comes from, I believe, Latin words. Circum meaning around, and spect, uh, view, or look. Look around you. And so we'll find, if we, we'll find the concept or the idea in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel, if you turn with me there, chapter 7. I'm going to put it on the screen, but I want you to turn to it in your, in your Bible so, so that you can look around at the context that's around it, and we'll read it. We'll read it, we'll read it together. It says in verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of lawlessness. I think one of the most terrifying passages in all of Scripture. So I want to focus in on this one word initially that this, the beginning of the text that we read starts out, out with, and that is the word beware. A beware, the Greek word for beware is prosecco. Uh, prosecco comes from the word, uh, first of our pros, which is uh, looking forward or looking toward, and then uh, echo, which is to have or to hold. So the, the, the word beware has a sense of, of uh, to pay attention, to hold, in a sense to hold the mind towards, and, and to look towards, to pay attention to, to be cautious about, to apply oneself to, to adhere, to give attention to, beware, be given to, give or take heed to, or have regard. Be, beware is, uh, so the, the Greek word is uh, prosecho, but then this particular, in this, this passage here, it has this ending, ete, so it's, it's Prosecheta, uh, and eta is basically the present active imperative, second person plural, 
All right, can you say that 10 times fast? Present active imperative, second person plural. So basically, the uh, second person plural is speaking regarding it, uh, of, of someone else to an audience of more than one. So, so if it's first person, I'm talking about me, right? And if it's second person, I'm talking about someone else. But second person plural is to someone else but all, all right? So there's a, in the South, in, in uh, the States, we have, we have y'all, right? We, we don't say that in Michigan, but we understand like down South, that's, they'll say y'all. But y'all can mean singular second person plural. I could, I could say y'all want, if I was from the South, they would look at me funny if I said this in Michigan or in Canada, I could say y'all want to come over and it could be one person. But so when it's second person plural, it's all y'all, right? Have you ever heard, did you know that? Am I telling you something new? So there's, there's y'all, which is one, and there's all y'all, which is second person plural, right? And then we have, the next one is uh, present active imperative. This is a, com these are commands that are expected to be followed, not once, but in an ongoing process. Or, or, and so it's, it's like, so if you went to a doctor and the doctor said, I don't uh, want you to eat, I want you to, to, to not, to lay off the sugar, right? W what he's saying to you isn't, okay, so on the next meal, I'll lay off sugar, but then go back eating sugar after that, right? No, what he is meaning is lay off sugar now and continuously, right? So that's this Greek word. So it's basically, it's the idea of, if, of all y'all, I want you to beware, and I want you to keep on bewaring, right? right that's horrible English, but, but you, get the, you get the idea. And so th this, is, this is kind of the Greek word. So to beware and keep on bewaring. And what is the, what is the first thing that we see in the text? that he's asking us to beware of false prophets. He's saying beware of false prophets. Uh, false prophet in the Greek is pseudo, false prophetes, false prophet. And guess what the word uh, uh, C is in? It is in present active imperative. So see to it. Oh, and I actually, sorry, I, I skipped a verse. I have in my Bible here, I have this passage in, uh, right here, I put a couple verses. I've only got four verses right now that are, that kind of stood out to me that I want to front of the cover of my Bible. Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, it says, See to it that no one leads you astray. So you see to it that no one leads you astray. And that word see is in that continue, see to it and continue seeing to it that no one leads you astray, right? So, so we don't, do we look to our elders to see to it that no one leads us astray? Well, hopefully they will help us with that. It's kind of under shepherds of the whole flock. Do you look to parents to see to it that no one leads you astray? Well, I, I hope that they can help with that. Uh, do you look to me or the preachers up here to see to it that no one leads you astray? He's saying you. You see to it. It's your responsibility to be in this book to see to it that no one leads you astray. We have, in our culture right now, it's growing like this word of faith movement this new apostolic reformation movement this, this, that is saying that they'll come to you and they'll say, I have a word of the Lord for you. Have anybody ever had someone say that to them? I have a word of the Lord for you. For you. And I'm like, well, that's great, but I need to hear it from the Lord, right? And it can never... The word, the, the word of the Lord that they have can never, ever, ever contradict this book. And, and I'm, I'm flabbergasted at how easily and how quickly deceived uh, people are. And they get carried away by some very, very energetic, fancy-suited, fancy-watched person up on a stage that has some revelation. And... and 
I, I'm not going to name names or anything because it's probably recorded, but, but I remember having a conversation with someone about, they were saying, well, we, you know, this is the way it's going to be in the, la in the last days, and there's going to be this and this and this. They're all saying these different things. And I, I was like, but the, the, the Bible says this. And then I was reading it. And then the, and then the Bible says, says this, right? And, and then this person said to me, well, I, I know that's what, that's what the Scripture says, but there's revelation. It gave me chills. So you're telling me that some guy in a fancy suit that stood up and said in this energetic way, and asked for your money, by the way, uh, that he has a revelation from God, and you're taking what he says above the Word of God? It's false. It's false. We have a standard by which we measure everything. So our Lord made it our responsibility to be aware of false prophets in uh, John, 1 John chapter 4, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets, have, they've already gone out into the world. But this you, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not, is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is, now, is, is, and is now in the world already. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. We, by this we know the spirit of truth and error. Us, meaning the apostles, if, if they... Uh, he's saying, whoever does not listen to us, whoever is not from God, does not listen to us, to the Word of God. Whoever is from God listens to us. That's the apostles, right? So we have this standard of the Word of God. And at that particular time, he was also addressing a specific thing called uh, Gnosticism. The, Gnos the Gnostics believed that uh, Jesus, he came down in kind of a a wooshy woo body, but he w didn't have an actual physical body. They believe like if he were to walk on the sand, like he would walk, but there wouldn't be footprints. And, and in a sense, like when he was on the cross, well, he died, but, uh, but you know, not, not all of him, not all of that. It was more of like a, 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 he suffered, but it was more of like a, a spiritual thing, not necessarily a physical thing. It was all this mixed up. Jesus Christ, the, cr the cr creator, came down and became flesh and walked among us. And that flesh was and is God. And so there's a sense where what he's talking about is they deny the deity of Christ. See, all these religions around here, they'll all say that, oh, Jesus, like, you know, he, like, he's a good guy. Like, uh, he was a teacher. He's a good teacher. Like, you, you should listen to him, right? Uh, the, the Muslims, the Quran says that he's a prophet. And not only he's a prophet, but you should hear him. Right? And the... The, the Buddhists, they believe that he, he was a good teacher. The Hindus believe that he was basically one of the gods, right? Even an atheist will read Jesus' teaching, and he'll be like, that's pretty good, pretty good stuff, right? You, yeah, you should probably listen to him. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he is saying, see that no one leads you astray. He's also saying in Matthew 24, 13, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Sometimes there'll be these, these works, that, these things that are happening. And, you know, there was, a, there was this revival, uh, the Asbury revival that was happening in, in a college. And I was, I was just asking questions about it. Like, I was just asking, like, is the word of God preached? Like, is there repentance from sin? Right? Well, I, I, th I think they're just doing, like, a lot of singing. Like, all night long. The singing goes, like, all night for days. The singing's been going. But is the word of God preached? Is the person of Jesus Christ exalted? Is sin declared to be for what it is? Is there a call for repentance? And they look at me like I'm, like, you know, doubting Thomas or something. Oh, you just need to 
to believe. No, it says that we're supposed to try. We're supposed to try the Spirit. Um, so, beware of false prophets. The next thing the text is telling us to beware of is to beware of sheep's clothing. It says, false prophets, they come to you in sheep's clothing. What does that mean? Sheep's clothing are people are dressed like you. Right? So beware of people that are dressed like you. Their external shows are meant to make you comfortable with them. So the interesting thing about legalism is that uh, if you're in a group of legalism, it becomes really, really easy, actually, to fake it. Right? Like, you can just put on a, whatever the uniform is. You can just say the things that you know are similar to that area. Our brother was talking about, uh, was encouraging me after, in between the, the meetings here, about the difference between a fold and a flock. And I hadn't heard that before, but it was a really, he thought, Jesus said that I have many, or many will come uh, that I'll bring into this flock, and they are fold, and they will become one flock. A fold has to do with, like, outside circumference or, or containment, right? A flock has to do with the, the shepherd in the center, is, is uh, centered around a person. Where the, the, so, so we have like the law and legalism, and a lot of times we make our, our identity, our unity, right? Or our uniformity is probably actually a better word for it. Our uniformity around external stuff. And it'd be, it's very, very easy to get deceived, to get blindsided by when, when the outside stuff, when the external stuff is the reason for our unity or our uniformity. But when Jesus, when Jesus is the reason for our unity, then we can kind of move in and out of, of you know, preferences and backgrounds and, and, and convictions that each one have as individuals, and, and we can find this bond of unity in the person of Christ. And there's safety in that. Amen? There's fellowship in that. And it's actually, it's actually kind of sweeter when you have two, you know, you have another brother and, and or another, another family over years, and you have differing opinions on some of the kind of side issues, but Christ is your, is your main, and you can, you can have discussions about those things and learn from them, but then Christ is your center, and you can, you can fellowship and rejoice in him. It's this, it's this almost, there's a special sweetness in that, right? Because we know that he's the only reason that we have that, sweetness together so beware of sheep's clothing so then it also says in the text beware uh, of the sheep's clothing inwardly they are ravening wolves so it's saying beware of wolves uh, in Acts chapter 20 verse 29 Paul says I know that after my departure fierce wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock that's why it's so important to pray for your, the elders and that the Lord raises up those who, who are, have a shepherd heart that see those wolves, whether they are false doctrine, bad doctrine, or people coming in that just want to, to spy out the liberty that's in Christ, right? Like in Galatians, and go after those wolves. In Galatians 2, Four through five, yet because of false brothers brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment. We did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved in you. The enemy wants to come in and he wants to say, well, yeah, you know, the gospel, Jesus is good. But Jesus plus, you know, that, we got that over here. Right? That's what was going on in Galatians. Yeah, I, I know Jesus is good, but Jesus plus circumcision, that's what you need, right? Paul was, when you, we just finished with a college group 
uh, studying verse by verse, chapter uh, by chapter through the book of Galatians. And Paul is very, um, I think he's some of the harshest, even on the edge, vulgar language, to, a shocking language in the sense to, uh, to, the, to the church of Galatians. He was so distraught that there were people coming in and they were being swept away with Jesus plus or Jesus minus, right? So beware of wolves. And the next one, pay attention uh, to, it says uh, in the text here, you will recognize them by their fruit. So we pay attention to the fruit. We, we need to become fruit judges, in a sense. We need to look and see uh, what their fruit are. So how do, we, how do we recognize them? By the fruit. In Galatians 5, we have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And then there are other fruits, right? The, the fruit of the flesh. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest. This is right before the fruits of the Spirit, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hated, or a hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such thing will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we see here clearly in scripture that we have this litmus test that we can see them we can see them by their fruit. How do we know what good fruit is? By the word of God. So then we have this next one. If you're going to look for false teachers, we can look and beware. The scriptures are teaching to beware of false teaching. So turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Then we have what we call, what I call, uh, the Gamaliel method. Right? Someone mentioned that just today. Uh, I don't remember who it was. The Gamaliel method of measuring the truth or not. So, Acts chapter 5, verses 33 through 42. Uh, so it says that when they heard this, they are enraged and wanted to kill them, uh, the apostles. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, this is a very highly respected uh, person, one that Paul was uh, being taught. If you learned under the feet of Gamaliel, it was kind of like, like saying, I went to Harvard, right? Or I went to Yale. He's a highly respected person. Uh, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people. He stood up. And he gave orders to put them in outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For behold, uh, for before these days, Thutius rose up, claiming to be somebody. And a number of men, about 400, joined him. And he was killed. And all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. And after him, Judas, the Galilean, rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. And he too perished. And all who followed after him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak the name of Jesus, and they let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, the apostles, uh, rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple, and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ, the Messiah, is Jesus. So we have this situation where they're, they're going to kill the apostles, and then Gamaliel stands up. He's like, hang on, you know, there was these individuals, and, 
and it kind of it just fizzled out. And then there's this individual coming, and it just kind of fizzled out. If, if this is from God, it will last. And if it's not from God, it'll fizzle out. And it ended up kind of having a, a good result, or a, if you want to say, a true, uh, a, a good, uh, an accurate result in the sense that, you know, that the apostles were able to go and continue on teaching, right? Uh, so you could look at it in a pragmatic way, and pragmatism is not the measure for which we uh, measure what is true or what is not true. Pragmatism is, you know, if it, if it works, it's good. Right? So, you know, Jeremiah would be a failure because none of his preaching ever worked, right? Uh, Noah would be a failure, even though he was a successful boat builder. Uh, he, he, no one listened to him but his own family. Right? If, if, you, if pragmatism was the standard with which we measured what is right and wrong, and this is basically what he's doing. He's measuring it with a measuring stick of pragmatism. Uh, and it's a, it's a false measuring stick. It's, it's so, like, so did that mean Buddhism is right? Because it lasted longer than his lifetime. Right? Hinduism would be right. Islam would be right. It's a, it's a bad measuring stick. So I, I brought with me, her brother lent this, uh, lent this to me here. Uh, we have this measuring tape. And uh, on one side, the centimeters are really big. And on the other side, the inches are really small, right? You guys, you guys have these at, at home, you know? Um, how many, I don't know if any one of you, I feel like I have a memory as a, as a child when I was young. My dad, he was a builder and... And it had a different one, and I was measuring the inches with the small inches, right? The, the centimeters, and it, and it turned out really wrong. Or maybe it's just somebody told me the story. I don't, I don't remember. But we have, like over in America, we have, you know, inches and feet and miles, and, and they make no sense at all. I, I don't know. There's, I'm sure there's a reason or sense. Behind. To me, centimeters, kilometers, uh, millimeters, like that actually makes, makes a lot more sense to me. But we have different measurements for different kingdoms, in a sense, right? God has given us the measuring stick for his kingdom. He has given us the measuring stick for his kingdom. And we must measure everything to that standard, right? The Bereans, uh, Acts chapter 17 so we have the Galilean method, and then we have the Berean method. Sure, I know you're all familiar with this, but let's read it together. Uh, Acts 17, verses, uh, starting in verse 10. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So here the apostles were. They're in there preaching with some authority. They got stripes on their back kind of authority, right? There's healings. Miracles that are done, sitting at the feet of Jesus kind of authority, right? And they're teaching, and these Bereans, they're commended because they, they receive it with eagerness, and then they go and examine the what? The scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them, therefore believed. Many of them therefore believed because they, they received what they were saying. Then they went home and studied it for themselves. They were in the book themselves and therefore they believed. The measuring stick that we have is the word of God. God has given us the measuring tape that works in his country and it is that line by which we must measure everything that is taught. And that means we need to be in it. 
And we need to be in it every day. Not just like a, a five-minute thing. So I, I, I'm going to talk with you about just some practical things that I do. And I'm not perfect. I'm not saying that I've arrived, but just to encourage you to, to continue in the Word of God. I have this, uh, right now I'm reading through uh, chronologically. This is my, my, where I'm at uh, in my schedule. I took away all the dates. You know, you have a one-year Bible schedule. The dates end up like discouraging uh, or distracting me so that I, I forget about the Word of God and it's just about checking off the date. No oh, man, you know, it's, it's August 11 and I'm only in July 30, right? And I just got to catch up and it becomes a chore. That's just me. Some of you might, might work like that. So I took away all the dates. And I just put, there's just little lines uh, so I can, I'll just make a mark when, it, when that reading section is done. And it's okay for me if it takes a couple days for me to check it off. And it's okay if I check a couple of them off in a day. Because it isn't so much to me about checking off my to-do list. It's about enjoying the Word of God in a systematic way, moving through the Word of God. Because what, what happens, right? You, you're reading in this chapter in Isaiah, and you remember that that was quoted by the Apostle Paul, you know, over in Romans, and you want to go look at the passage in Romans. And, and you just, you just, you know, you just want to graze around. And then you want to you pull out a commentary, and you want to go deeper on the, but oh, I can't do it because i got to check my date off. Anybody ever been there? Am I the only one? Right? It takes the joy out of it. But it is important for us as believers to be disciplined. That's what a disciple means. Like a disciple and disciplined in progressing through the Word of God, whether it's from Genesis to Revelation, I believe, or, uh, or, you know, or, or chronologically, I believe it's important that we continually progress through the Word of God. Uh, my... My study time for my messages don't count. Right? I, I need to be feeding myself. So before I start studying for what to share, I come to God, Lord, I need daily bread for me first. Right? Give us this day our daily bread. Because yesterday's bread was good, but I need some for today. We've got to have it today. And uh, five minutes, like, if that's all you got, I, there's, a, there's a saying at, on Anna's, in Anna's room in Paul and, and um, Joanne's house that she wrote on the wall. It says, God will never make your day too busy that you can't spend time with him. That's just wrong, right? Why would he, I will make it too busy. For sure. That this world will, but God won't. And, and if you make your time with God at the beginning of your day, you know, the things that you do first in the day get done. Did you know that? You ever think about that? You got your to-do list? The thing that you do first in the day always gets done. I mean, it seems really simple, Right? But guys, make, and I know like some, some people like to read at night before I, can, I, I get to the end of the night and I'm just shot. Like I, you know, I start to read and boom, I'm, I'm one of those fast fall asleep people, right? So whenever it is, I'm just challenging you. I, and I know there are many of you here that are better at it and more seasoned at it and more and more faithful at it than, than me. I'm not saying that I've arrived, but it is, it is my regular intent to be in the Word of God, and a, a minimum of, like, I try to be, be a minimum of a half an hour a day, not a two-minute, a five-minute, and just to read and to listen and be free to graze around in the Word of God. Uh, so that's my exhortation to you, to be in it, because that's our measuring stick. That's how we'll know when some false doctrine comes to us. Like, um, it's kind of like this. When you... Uh, you take driver's ed, you know, 
you study the book in a classroom setting before you go out and go on the road. This is wisdom, right? Uh, you, you don't... That you don't, that when they, you don't go get in the car with your driver's ed book, textbook, on the passenger seat or in the middle console and then start driving, right? You, you, though this red, what's that mean, right? Oh, it's green, what's that mean, right? Uh, you, you know, wait, wait, what side of the road am I supposed to be on? No, you, you study the book. And, and then because you know the book, when you run into situations in life, you know how to apply the book. Amen? So being in the Word, you can't, you, that's, people treat the Bible like that. They'll be like, oh, when I just get in that situation, then I'm just going to find it. And even, you know, my, mine has these topical, mine, this one doesn't, but mine has topical so I can look up, oh, uh, salvation, you know, or. Oh, prayer, and they, they can look it up and look up verses for it. It doesn't work like that. Be in the book every day. And then as you walk through life, the Lord will bring to your remembrance the things that he's already taught you for that moment. And that's part of walking with him in a living way. So what else do we beware of? It says, so every tree that cannot bear, every tree, every, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So we need to beware of disease. Disease is sin, right? Uh, it's, the, it's the common thing that's known, like it's, a, it's likened to like the, the, the leprosy that cling to name it. What a perfect picture of sin. And as Naaman went down into the water, he identified with the death of Christ, and he was raised, right? And the sin was washed away. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of, life, or the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ and Christ alone is the remedy and cure for the disease of sin. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The scriptures are telling us to beware of the fire. In uh, Revelation 19, verse 20, Revelation 19, verse 20, it says, and the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he is deceived. The, uh, he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And then Revelation 20, 7 through 15 says, and when the thousand years were ended, Satan, uh, Satan was released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, and from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And then another book was opened, and which is the book of life. And the dead were judged, by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written 
in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So we see that the beast and the false prophet, the devil, death and hell, and whoever was not found in the book, found written in the book of life, was thrown into the lake of fire. And then we have this last passage that we read. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What is the will of the Father in heaven? That we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone who does not do the will of my Father in heaven, on that day, will, uh, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many wonderful works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of lawlessness. It's the most terrifying passage uh, in the scripture. But listen to what they're saying. Lord, didn't I do? Right? Didn't I put on sheep or sheepskin? Didn't I put on my sheep, sheepfold? Didn't I do the things that were acceptable? Right? None of them said, but Lord, didn't you die for me? They were the focus. He wasn't the focus, right? Philippians 2, 12 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, as you have obeyed, so now, not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In John 7, 17, If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God. So as you look to God, and as you are in his word, and as you study it, you will be able to discern and understand when the lies come out there. And there, there are many and various, uh, you know, uncountable numbers of lies. And it's incredible how good people have got at lying today. Like they'll look you right in the eye. And they will speak something that you know, and you know that they know, is an absolute falsehood. And it's, it's, it's so like bold and brazen that it kind of, kind of takes you back a little bit and you start to even like doubt. What, do I, like maybe I have it wrong. You ever been there before? Maybe, do, is, that, is that right? You start to question it. But be in the word. This is the right measuring stick. God has given us everything that we need by his word, by his spirit, by his presence in our lives, by the community that we have with one another. He has given us everything we need in Christ to be not deceived and to walk in a way that we're paying attention and we're walking the way of life in this life and we can speak truth to others because that's what he's called us to do, to share the truth of God's word with others. So Father, we do thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have the words of life. To whom will we go? To whom will we go, Lord? Thou hast the words of life. They are life to us. They are truth to us. They are the way to us. I ask you, Lord, that you would encourage and bless and strengthen this precious body to be re-encouraged to be in your word every day and to, to become studiers of it. And Lord, to go out and to speak the truth in the face of the many falsehoods that are, are being proclaimed and prophesied around. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>